This is Artemis Launch Control with an update. Launch Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson has called a scrub for today. And so in that moment, the hopes and dreams of millions of people watching this incident came to an ignominious end. And I would say disappointing, but I'm afraid it was a little bit more extreme than that. At first, I really wasn't going to do a report on this. I wasn't going to have any sort of ranting about it or anything because it was a first launch attempt. This is not atypical at all. In fact, it's highly unusual that you're going to see see a rocket fly on its first attempt on the pad. However, there were things about this particular scrub that were extremely annoying and also avoidable. And on top of that, there was an enormous amount of patronizing excuses being made by the people in charge and by various people in the news media agency that I found to be utterly unacceptable. The the fact of the matter is, SLS has been consuming entirely too much in the way of funds, in the way of time, and time is something we really don't have when we're returning to the moon. What most people don't seem to realize is we're in a competition with the People's Republic of China to assume control of the Lunar South Pole. And yeah, it really is that serious, and even Administrator Nelson would agree with me on that. But what he doesn't seem to agree with me on is just how how unacceptable what happened yesterday actually was because virtually everything that caused that scrub was something that could have been taken care of before the attempt was even made. Hello YouTube, I'm the Angry Astronaut and this is... So NASA was kind enough to leap immediately into damage control mode. I'm glad that they did that, especially considering the vast number of things that happened with this launch attempt before they even got anywhere close to T minus five seconds or anything along those lines. We got to T minus 40 minutes or so before the whole thing was scrubbed. But hours prior to that, at about two in the morning Eastern Standard Time, it looked like the whole thing was going to be scrubbed right there and then because during the fueling process, they started experiencing yet another hydrogen leak. This was a problem that had plagued this system since the first two wet rehearsals. And what I find difficult to understand is why this problem wasn't rectified before this was even attempted. Once again, we had two wet rehearsals, both of which suffered from the same problems, and yet we brought the rocket right back out and tried it again without having a test that was devoid of these kinds of problems. And I was pretty hard on NASA after the second wet rehearsal was completed because they still had these unresolved issues, and the assumption was that the wet rehearsal went pretty well, and surely they would be able to handle this before they tried it again. Well, no, that wasn't the case, not at all. And it only just got worse from there. Fortunately, they did manage to rectify the hydrogen leak, although I'm not really certain, I'm not sure NASA is either, as to why it was rectified. It was more like, hello IT, have you tried turning it off and on again? So anyway, hallelujah, they fixed the hydrogen leak issue and actually managed to fully fuel the vehicle. It was starting to look very optimistic. However, according to NASA, in the aftermath, there were weather problems that were almost certainly going to cause a scrub. Excuse me? Weather problems? I was there. The weather was almost perfect. Yes, there may have been a little bit in the way of rain showers here and there, and according to what I heard, any sort of precipitation is going to stop this thing from taking off. If that indeed is the case here in Florida, they're going to have a hard as hell time maintaining any sort of launch cadence with this vehicle. I can understand thunderstorms. Obviously, you'd never want to launch in the middle of something like that, but minor showers? That is a huge problem with this 
this vehicle if that is an issue, but we'll move on from there. After that, the major problem, the problem that really torpedoed this whole issue is the fact that they couldn't properly cool engine number three. Now, a lot of suggestions were made that there was a problem with engine number three. I didn't believe that from the start because these engines are absolutely fantastic. We're talking about engines that have been up to space many, many times, have been reused flawlessly. One thing I would ask you to note is that the RS-25s have never experienced a total failure in their entire history. That is to say, there was never an RS-25 engine shut down in flight with the exception of STS-51 at T plus 5 minutes and 43 seconds, but that wasn't a problem with the engine in itself. It was actually due to faulty temperature sensors, so the engine didn't even really fail on that occasion. In all previous times where we had engine failures, which by the way, once again, only happened six times in the entire history of the space shuttle program, they happened prior to launch. That's an incredibly good record. These are extremely good engines, and I knew it wasn't a problem with that, and indeed it was not. Instead, it was a bleed line issue with engine number three, and what that does is it's designed to flow hydrogen into the engines to cool them thermally for flight, and it worked fine for three of the engines, but not for engine number three, and that was because of pressure issues being caused by valves. Have you ever heard that before? It seems that Boeing has lots of issues with valves, and this is something that seems to be located in the core stage. However, I wouldn't be surprised if these pressure issues and perhaps valve issues were actually being caused by insufficient pressure being generated by Mobile Launch Tower 1. Why do I think that? Well, first of all, it's important to understand why this is required in the first place. These engines burn so incredibly hot that they will actually melt themselves if they are not being constantly cooled by liquid hydrogen, which is, of course, one of the coldest substances in the universe. If you don't have a proper hydrogen flow over the engines keeping them cool, they are going to be completely destroyed by the incredible heat generated by Full thrust, but here's the issue. This had no problems whatsoever during the green run. These engines ran flawlessly for hundreds of seconds without a single problem with the coolant system. What happened between then and now? Did they run a forklift into the thing or something like that? Did they have some sort of handling problem in transport? This seems extremely unlikely. NASA is very, very careful with these things. The only thing that's really changed is the ground systems, the mobile launch tower that I've been ranting about forever. However, that may not be the case. I could be off target on that because when they increased pressure in the system in order to try to rectify the issue, there was another problem with a vent valve, yet another valve, in the intertank portion of the core stage between the liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen tanks. That seemed to involve a leak. Now, they are studying this valve problem. Perhaps the leak was somewhere in the mobile launch tower umbilicals rather than in the core stage itself. We just don't know that yet. Quote, the challenge that was created was we wanted to increase the pressure in the tank in order to establish the hydrogen bleed and the vent valve wasn't cooperating. That was the point where the team decided it was appropriate to declare the scrub because we just weren't going to make the two-hour window. It was one of those situations where we just knew we needed more time. Okay, I accept that. What I do not accept is the fact that these very same problems transpired with the previous two wet rehearsals and were never rectified. This is completely unacceptable to have these ongoing issues and yet can't launch while you're having these problems and never really fixing them, never confirming that you have them fixed and then do everything that's necessary to prepare for a launch. And by the way, that's a complicated process that involves not only personnel, but also money knowing full well that you may have the same problem when it happens again. 
What kind of logic is that? However, NASA did defend their position on that, fine, whatever. But afterwards, the level of patronizing nonsense that we got from not only NASA, but also experts in the field, that's when I started to get nauseated. Predictably, most of the media didn't even criticize NASA for this situation, but on CBS News, they actually had the guts to ask, were the public going to lose confidence in SLS after it's gone so far over budget and experienced all of these issues? And Derek Pitts, who's the chief astronomer and director of the Fells Planetarium, also a NASA solar system ambassador since 2009, acknowledged that yes, indeed, the public might lose confidence in NASA and this program because they just don't understand. Ha ha ha, yeah, that's it. The unwashed masses, they just don't get it. Well, let me ask you something, Dr. Pitts. How many Office of the Inspector General reports do you read every month? Because I'll tell you something, it makes for very good reading, and I advise that you go and consult that before you start making statements about the public not understanding SLS, and it's just out of ignorance that we're beginning to lose patience with this damn thing. Because the Office of Inspector General, NASA themselves, are also losing patience with this. And the arrogance didn't stop there. Of course, Administrator Nelson also talked about what an incredibly complex machine this is, and also talked about how his particular shuttle flight was scrubbed four times, and this is something that we can expect. Well, that may be true, Administrator Nelson, but you also need to take into account that the particular flight you're referring to was scrubbed twice because of extreme weather conditions, and also the Space Shuttle Columbia at the time had gone through 18 months worth of extensive modifications that had yet to be fully tested. So scrubs were to be expected on that particular mission. And I would also remind you that the first launch of Columbia was scrubbed just a few minutes prior to liftoff because of a minor software issue. They patched it way back in 1981 on a system that was far more complicated than SLS and had had the shuttle off the ground two days later. And it also bears mentioning that from the first design drawings in 1972 of the finished product of the Space Shuttle to the launch of Space Shuttle Columbia was nine years. Again, on something that was far more complicated and something that NASA had never even done before, as opposed to SLS, that's taken 11 years. And 95% of this rocket is utilizing the same technology was that was developed for Columbia. There are no excuses for this, and it's time for NASA to start acknowledging this, and their Office of Inspector General is already acknowledging this, and provide the United States with greater assurances that they're going to get these problems fixed and move forward, because with every day this launch is delayed, it costs more taxpayer money, and it puts the entire project at risk. And there's a human element to this as well. Jessica Watkins, who is the first black woman to ever serve on a long-duration space mission who's currently on the ISS right now. She is a prime candidate for being both the first woman and the first person of color to set foot on the moon. And the more time that goes by and the more money that gets spent on this project without tangible results means the greater the chance that Congress is finally going to pull the plug on it and Jessica will never have a chance to set foot on the moon ever. And there's something else to consider as well. On dozens of occasions yesterday, NASA had to consider debris avoidance issues as well. There were a number of times that even if they wanted to, SLS could not have lifted off because all of the space junk that it potentially could have crashed into. Dozens of times that a launch simply couldn't happen. We're only talking about a couple of seconds for each particular time, but never 
nevertheless, that also complicates any launch that's going to be taking place and something that should be considered as we start deploying thousands and thousands of satellites in these vast constellations. But more importantly, because of issues like this, NASA cannot afford to have more problems that could have been avoided with simple common sense. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please hit that notification bell button. That's very important to my channel. And also check the description for various ways to support my content. And as always, stay angry about space.